Hi, I'm Larry Levin of STL Nonprofit News and welcome to our feature, What Do You Know? It's a particularly apt name for this installment in our series of Zoom interviews and accompanying articles. And that's because today's guests are trying to answer that question about the information we have about our region's nonprofit sector, and perhaps more importantly, the information we don't have, but that could be highly useful to the vitality and equity of that sector in helping the region and the lives of those who live here. So with us today are Liz Eichmann and Paul Sorensen. Liz, the author, and Paul, the supporting contributor to the St. Louis Regional Nonprofit Indicators Report, uh, with additional support from the Clark Fox Family Foundation. The report was uh, published in September of 2021 by the Regional Data Alliance and the University of Missouri St. Louis Community Innovation and Action Center. Liz and Paul, welcome. Thank you so, so much Liz, for having us. Sure. Liz, can you tell us a little bit about your background and both your passion for this work and the skills you've developed along the way to be able to do this work? Yeah, I um, am a political science PhD candidate, um, as well as a data and research manager at the Community Innovation and Action Center. And one of my research interests are uh, is the nonprofit sector. Um, and I've... <clears throat> been lucky enough to work on quite a few research projects um, related to the nonprofit sector in different capacities um, and feel very strongly about its importance in our society um, and um, very interested in always being able to provide um, research um, and insights into the sector um, because there aren't, well, we have lots of good information. Um, there's always more we can learn. Sure. Thank you. And Paul, who we've talked to before here at Nonprofit News, could you offer us a little bit of the same? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we're always chewing on both as at the university, but also the, the Regional Data Alliance is you know, thinking about infrastructure and like data infrastructure in particular. And, you know, there's a lot of good questions to ask. Um, and there are a lot of people in the region um who are asking those questions and i think our job in the nonprofit indicators report and otherwise yeah I, I think is to provide some baseline knowledge of like what does this even look like and like what information is available um but what we're also trying to do is empower a variety of folks um, throughout the region at nonprofits other universities advocates to ask deeper questions about what are we missing and where do we need to go from here um and so the nonprofit indicator report, I think, is a great example of trying to provide some insight uh, into what uh, information is publicly available. Um, but then also try to push a little bit further on, OK, is the information that's available allowing us to answer the questions that we're really wanting to ask as a sector uh, around equity, around impact, around where we go from here? Um, and I think surprising or not, you know, our conclusions are that we have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was, it kind of reminded me of when I've started at a nonprofit before and have really started by saying, I don't know what I don't know, right? And, and so that's kind of what I took the report as, which was a way to get from not knowing what we don't know about the data associated with the region's nonprofits to starting to know what we don't know about the data associated with nonprofits in the region. So at a very mile high level, Liz, is that a kind of a fair characterization of where, where you were uh, starting and trying to go with the report? I think so. I think that we tend to know more about inputs and outputs of the sector than about the sector landscape itself, mm -hmm. um, especially in the region. Um, I think we ask pretty, a lot of these questions are rather basic in nature and you know, the number of nonprofits, what kind of funding we have, et cetera. Sometimes I refer to it as the black box of nonprofits. We have a lot of information about the inputs, i.e. grants, or maybe the number of people working in a sector and potentially you know, the services that they provide or the number of people that they serve. Um, but the landscape itself is sometimes trickier to, to understand um, because as Paul mentioned, um, it's really dependent upon the public data that we have available now that really shapes um, our understanding and knowledge of the sector. Yeah. And, and let's, although I know it's probably on page 64 of the report, let's start with some of the whys in terms of why the data is so important. From, from each of your perspectives, maybe you could give one or two of the kind of the most important things to you personally 
that building a better data set could provide us in knowing more about um, the nonprofit sector in the St. Louis region. Liz, you wanna start? Yes, um, to me, the, the biggest call out in the report is definitely around equity. Um, a lot of our data comes from um, the Internal Revenue uh, Service. So we have a lot of information about finances. We know we can dig pretty deep into that information and it makes sense, you know, those, um, IRS 990 forms are meant for compliance reasons. Mm -hmm. um, there is no demographic data, um, no data collected about individuals, um, regardless of you know whether it's board, staff, uh, clients, et cetera. So it's a pretty huge hole um, in the nonprofit data landscape. Um, and the way it's currently really being filled is that um, you know there's kind of these one-off reports that are typically done. Um, mm -hmm. It costs a lot of money to do it that way. Um, and also there's no standardization um, across those reports. And a lot of times they are, you know, limited. It's a one-time report. Um, so I think that while we know there is disparity within the nonprofit sector, um, we kind of lack the longitudinal view or uh, an overall view of, you know, what it really looks like and what, it, um, what equity looks like in the sector. And did you even have, um, you know, researchers like to look at what has come before? Did you even have a model that you thought was a reasonable model from which to start? Or did you believe in what you looked at for building this, you almost had to start from scratch? Uh, that's a great question. So um, we did a lit review of um, indicators that are typically used at the population level um, in nonprofit reports, um, as well as try to develop some of our own indicators around equity. Um, and even after really trying to dive deep into that, we really came to the conclusion that any information that we would be able to provide um, isn't very meaningful because of the lack of data. Um, we have some proxies we can use that get close to answering questions, but they really aren't that accurate um, and maybe not even helpful. So I think we really landed in a place in understanding that it's probably more important for us to raise these concerns and questions than it is for us to try and approximate or you know, uh, develop indicators yeah. that <laughs> yeah. maybe get close to, you know, the answers that we're trying to provide. Good. And, yeah. and, and, and Paul, in, in terms of building the um, study, you compared characteristics of our region to those in other cities, uh, Baltimore and Kansas City and Indianapolis. And maybe you could talk about the, the, those areas and what made them good barometers to compare uh, and contrast our region to. I'm going to, I'm going to throw that specific question back to Liz in a second. Okay. Just to, just to, to add, question. <laughs> yeah, just to add on to that other point, right? I mean, I, you know, the, there is uh, no shade being cast to the importance of legal compliance and making sure that, oh, you know, course. nonprofit leaders aren't pilfering public dollars and yada, yada, but it really is telling, right? I think both that that's the information we have from an IRS standpoint and really in you know pursuit of, of tax exempt status and those sorts of things. And I'll also say most of the nonprofit reports that are produced uh, throughout the country um, are done by accounting firms or folks sure. with like a substantial anchoring in that methodology because, right, like this is primarily a financial report, but just to kind of put a pin or like give a good example, yeah. Um, of why proxies for equity or impact are very hard using publicly available data. Okay. You know, one of the ways we've seen people do it is they will use a geographic proxy. Mm -hmm. So they will say, okay, we can pull um, address data about organizations and try to understand like, you know, geographically, are they dispersed in a place that is representative of um, a client population? And even that, like, and we point later on in the report of like how one would go about collecting that information, you know, there's a difference uh, between a uh, organization's home office, uh, the home office of their lawyer who is filing the report, uh, the constituency served, the demographic makeup of, of, you know, staff and board, and none of those things are present in publicly available data, which makes so many of the proxies just like a like weak, if not irrelevant, in a way, I think it's important for us to pay attention well, to. Well, and you anticipated, so I'm going to put Liz off just for 30 seconds, because one of my next questions was, you know, while we're looking at what locally registered or recorded nonprofits do, we, we don't necessarily know from this particular study uh, about national groups that do work in our region 
regional groups that do work in our region, state groups, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, in another life, I run a, a two-state regional organization that does work in this particular region, but a lot of that would be virtually impossible together from a regional yeah. perspective. Yep. Yep. No, I, I think that's that's spot on. I mean, I think some of it you can track, but again, you're tracking dollars. You're not tracking yeah. impact. And, and look, uh, the report is 93 pages long. Um, there's a lot of information there. But I'll tell you, one of our intents was to exhaust publicly available data and say, like, right. we, we have, like, squeezed as much insight as we can out of this. And it provides some good things. I hope later on you ask us about like, we've been trying to listen, I'm thinking of like Mythbusters, like what are the, some, some surprising things that we found yeah, in yeah, uh, yeah. publicly available data? But um, most of it seems like an academic exercise, like counting the number of, you know, subcategory groups and comparing them. Because in some ways, you know, it's not what folks in the sector are talking about. I mean, you talk to philanthropic leaders, you talk to nonprofit leaders, you talk to other folks who care about the sector, they're not talking about like relative, you know, financial state year over year and employment breakdowns. I, I think sometimes they are, but it's like in passing as folks who are looking at the entire sector, what people are asking questions about are, how do we know an organization is fulfilling its mission? How do we know that they're on a path to, to equity? How do they collaborate with other organizations? And we have a long, long way to go in order to sufficiently answer any of those questions. Hey, to, to shamelessly lift from the current uh, Isaac Asimov-based uh, foundation series, how can you chart the future if you don't even know how to count stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's impossible. Or which, in their case, which base to use, but in your case, which data to have at your disposal. And you're doing the heavy lifting on some stuff that will save future uh, research efforts an awful lot of time and energy. And that's we're, we're hoping, although we didn't stray too far into psychohistory. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, yeah. here we are. <laughs> yeah. So back to Liz, the comparative regions and why they were chosen and, and, and why they were relevant to this exercise. Yeah, I would say there's kind of two main approaches um, to looking at the data um, throughout the report. So the first is a place-based approach. We recognize that where a nonprofit is located um, shapes it in profound ways. So we looked at um, Kansas City, Indianapolis, and Baltimore, um, as well as St. Louis, and when possible, also included national um, findings and data. Um, so we can better understand um, how St. Louis stacks up to um, city or metropolitan areas um, that are similar in demographics, um, that are similar. So when I'm, I'm talking about race and ethnicity, we also looked at black white segregation index, um, as well as population and um, local government was another consideration. Um, and I will quickly say that the other main approach was really looking at major groups, which are, um, there are 12 major groups within the nonprofit sector. We're all very aware that there's lots and lots of diverse organizations. Sure. Um, and so that really breaks down into hospitals, higher education, arts, culture, and humanities, human services, et cetera. And yeah. that's another very important frame um, for the report because as we all know, the nonprofits are very, very different within all of those major groups. And something that um, is done across all of the findings, or pardon me, all of the indicators, is that there are findings by major groups. So we can better understand um, how those major groups um, perform, um, what are their characteristics, um, because they are very different. Yeah, and I, I thought we might just take a couple, and then you can add your own, of course, about kind of a couple of those sectors and why they make St. Louis the same, different, what, et cetera, from these other markets. So one of the one of the sectors that was talked about was the healthcare and hospital sector, and and the you know the fact that we have this uh, I'll use a very um, uh, I'll use a very statistical term massive hospital sector in St. Louis, um, and that's a sector that brings in a ton of its revenue from programmatic services. Um, not as opposed to charitable uh, contributions, but it skews in the programmatic direction. And so that can be uh, a way that kind of identifies our region as maybe being a little different than another re region, just as an example, right? That's a great example. Um, yeah, we have um, some of the largest hospital systems and hospitals in the country. 
um, as well as a university with one of the top endowments. So when you talk about the um, hospital and also higher education major groups, um, they are composed much differently and perform much differently um, than other major groups. Um, you know, in the in the way that you just talked about, you know, it makes me think about, um, you know, one of the the myth busters um, of this report is, you know, I think we uh, there's um, kind of anecdotal understanding that people at nonprofits get paid less than for profits, um, but actually in the St. Louis region. Um, Nonprofit pay is about 2% more than for-profit pay in similar positions, but partly that is due to the fact <laughs> that pay is much higher in settings like hospitals and higher um, education. Yeah, right. exactly, where there's yeah. more specialized uh, workforces. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sure I, I, I should say I assume, but it's a question that the report raises, you know, is what kind of impact um, are the, you know, the largest nonprofits in the region, um, like hospitals and higher education, um, you know, how are they um, impacting that sort of view or even the view of the um, ratio of uh, participation based income to contributed income. Yeah, and, and another one I wanted to pick out uh, just again by way of example, and I'm picking these two out because I do have a follow up question about them is the religious sector, which uh, of course overlaps to some extent with the health sector. <laughs> Um, so uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that's different from other metros as a kind of overall percentage of whether it's the number of entities or the number of dollars or just the characteristics of that sector here. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting across the report, you're able to kind of start, to, I think, put some uh, dots together, especially for the religious um, major groups. Um, so first and foremost, you know, we looked at uh, the growth rate over 15 years. And while there was a 10% drop in the number of um, public charities between in those years, uh, religious organizations were one of the only one to have major gains in their numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that we saw contributed um, income to um, typically uh, religious organizations it seems to be a little bit higher. Um, and we also, I mean, but this is a really, the interesting point here is, um, I think goes back to the data, which is, you know, our knowledge is only as good as the data that we have. And something that um, this report calls out is that there are some limitations around religious organizations and that um, because of um, IRS um, yeah, what reporting they don't have to report, that's right. Correctly, yeah, yeah correct. So I'm, we do, um, I anticipate that, you know, we have an undercount on the number of religious organizations and probably some other things. And that's just because the public data um, doesn't capture uh, the entire universe of religious nonprofits in the region. Um, so we're able to like, you know, um, see some real trends in that group, especially. Um, but I do want to point out that, you know, because of the public data, there are limitations. Yeah. And, and as a reader, um, so this is just Larry, I'm not speaking to what uh, Liz and Paul have in the report. It gives me questions to ask, you know, so for instance, uh, you point to the Pew research about the general overall decline in, in religious participation in the country. So there are questions about if there were such a decline here, how it would affect that particular sector and the dollars and the services coming in and provided by it. And then for healthcare, again, since it's such a major part of our um, matrix of, of nonprofit work, you know, a change in the healthcare delivery system at the national policy level um, could have a profound impact on the nonprofit sector in St. Louis. Um, Paul, those are just two examples, but, they, they, they just kind of reek to me of a couple of ways that data is essential to kind of figuring out the both of the potential benefits and burdens of the nonprofit sector here in our future. Yeah, and also it's sort of like those two things don't share a ton in common. I think no. one of the things it also raises that, you know, like a tax status is not a mission orientation or a business model, right? right. And so like, you know, I think people often point to things like the NFL uh, as like, a, that's a nonprofit, like, do we really want to, you know? Um, so, you know, I think it, a lot of good questions involved, right? I mean, uh, regarding the, the Pew study, I think it, it would also raise um, some questions about religious participation, that the available public data around the growth of religious founded organizations is not yeah. able to answer. Okay. You don't know how many people are walking through the doors. You don't, you don't necessarily know anything but um, what's on that very limited uh, public disclosure. And so, you know, I think it raises some questions there. You know, although I think when when we think about the report and sort of the 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 recommendations for collecting additional information, 
we very specifically say, you know, and, and religion is sort of a subcomponent of this, although it may be included in, in some, although, you know, the, the idea of the public needing to know like what doctrine uh, certain, you know, institutions are promoting is probably not the sort of thing we're looking at. Yeah. Um, uh, but hospital systems and higher education institutions in particular, right, these very big kind of outliers, your VJCs and Ascensions or WashUs of the world, also probably are not where we want to spend the most of our time in answering some of these questions on equity and impact, which I think is a little bit more in the like public charity, you know, I think when people talk about a nonprofit colloquially, yeah, we're referring to a provider of some sort of service for community benefit. I think that's also where some of the, the missing points um, on the data side become the most challenging or problematic uh, because it really sometimes is hard to answer questions about like do we have enough food for people who are hungry you know or do we have enough you know beds for folks who are unhoused and the fact that we're not able to answer those questions and the fact that we don't even have these very basic starting points from an organizational level in order to answer you know the the sort of like supply side of that yeah. equation um is troubling, you know, and I, I think that it's important for folks to know uh, it's not that that data exists somewhere and someone just has to find it. It's that we actually don't know based on the information that's currently being collected. Uh, and that points to a different sort of challenge. Well, let me ask you both. Is there a benefit for those uh, mega nonprofits to, you know, play in partnership in this sandbox? You know, what 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 is in it for them to you know, to want to know this data and, you know, either respond to it or help acquire it. Is there, is there a benefit for them other than just being nice, friendly parts of our overall community? Well, look, I think that that is a core part of this work. Um, I, if you think of a nonprofit and a provider of housing services mm -hmm. as just a, you know, sort of business that is doing things, you know, not for profit, right? Like actually not making money, but to provide oh, okay. services, but well, you right. should just look at them at, as a business with competitive interests, you know, trying to grow their budget and retain their staff. Yeah. You know, I, I think maybe you would say the benefit is like, eh, hey, you know, it's it's a little negligible. There aren't a ton of incentives to report more information. Um, and right now it's not even like local government where people can do a sunshine request or otherwise <laughs> knock down your door to get exactly. that information. Yeah. On the other hand, right, I would I would argue, and I think some of this is also in some at least it's implied in nonprofit law, right? Like Nonprofit organizations, especially the public charities of the world, exist to serve a public interest, right? Not its own existence as an entity. And I would say if you look at that mission orientation and what you're supposed to be responsible for on behalf of the community, in many cases, it requires collaboration mm -hmm. or it requires partnership. Because the things that folks are looking to do, um, especially in the like public charity, you know, anti-poverty, like, you know, the, the things that I think people think about when they think about nonprofit, there's no way one organization can accomplish that mission on their own. Um, and so then I think you're starting to ask about, okay, but then how do you put the pieces together and where do we go from here? Well, I, I think that's right. And that was one of my questions down the road, Liz, which is it's hard to get significant data about partnerships and collaboration, right? I mean. I mean, you can get some foundation data about, you know, which grants were split amongst different, you know, nonprofits and, but boy, oh boy, I mean, that is, that is a time consuming and erratic kind of approach. So it, again, it goes back to, you know, how well will, you know, folks be willing to kind of engage in this exercise, which is both as I think, I think they should, because I think it's going to it's going to help their constituents. It's going to help their services in the long run. Um, we're not used to seeing big and small folks, nonprofits play that well together. That's one of the things we've tried to do at Nonprofit News is, is have um, big and small guys sit at the table together. Like for, we, had a, an, in, in, we had a segment where Arts and Faith, which is this tiny, tiny nonprofit, sat with the Art Museum to talk about a collaboration. What does that mean? I mean, you know, to the to the little to the little uh, nonprofit, they can act quickly. 
and they can act with great agility. The, non, the larger one is a little more institutional. How do they learn the common language? So uh, this is more a comment, but Liz, if you wanna take it and run with it, kind of how learning more about the data, the underlying these things can help people play well as they're, and I use play, you know, in, in not the most scientific term, you know, do their work well together as well as separately. Well, I mean, I think, you know, kind of going back to the idea around infrastructure, I think about it as though we all do have common needs um, and, you know, it, it, we all need to drive on roads, right? Everyone benefits from that, no matter how much money you make or how large, you are, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, so, and, and I really do think about data systems being the same way. Um, right now, for the most part, we have to rely on, there's been a privatization of a lot of nonprofit data and knowledge. Um, I'm, I don't know many people who, um, you know, are going to get IRS 990 information from the National Center for Charitable Statistics, which is where I got most of the information here. Um, and it's, and beyond that too, I really think about, but what do we need to know locally? Because what does join us together um, is not only our, our common needs for infrastructure, um, but you know, we are shaped, we, are, we, we live and work in the St. Louis region. So what is it particularly that we need to know about our nonprofit sector? How can we make sure that everyone has some sort of say and ownership in the data infrastructure that is uh, created, hopefully, um, so that we can better, we can have not only more accurate information, but actually be able to answer the questions that we have collectively. Um, for example, if racial equity is important to the St. Louis um, region's, you know, nonprofit sector, well then, heck, we better start thinking about um, how we're going to create some standards and collect data around those things. And I would argue, or I would hope, I should say, um, that no matter if you're big or small, um, that's important and will impact uh, your mission and activities. That's a really good example of how, because equity is a major component of this um, this report, and that's a great example of how um, data can inform work on equity and how small and larger groups can can do their work uh, in tandem with one another. Paul, you have any additional thoughts about that? No, I mean, I, I think the one thing I wanted to sort of highlight is that, you know, Liz mentioned the, the sort of privatization of this data, or really just this data has always been private in some ways. Like, I, I don't think it's, it's not nefarious per se. It's not, you know, Google coming in buying a bunch of nonprofit data to monetize, I don't know, like what the business model for that would be, but, but by the nature of who requests or, you know, holds this information, it, private, you know, in terms of not being able to be connected across large and small organizations, not being able to be accessed like folks by folks like us, who are trying to answer questions around um, the sector as a whole or for, for research purposes, etc., and it, it just ends up raising these bigger questions of like, I mean, do we want a system of, you know, connected, responsive, impactful public services? I mean, especially as more and more, you know, government services are also provided by nonprofits and the, the subsidy, right, um, that the government provides is substantial. Are we, are we okay just kind of, you know, funding activity here and there? having this wrong. you know system yeah. be fragmented and i i don't know i there's something that just like recoils in me it's like no that shouldn't be okay <laughs> but also it's never been anything but that um which is another really interesting question about where we go from here because we will be treading new ground in the St. Louis region or otherwise, um, if folks figure out a way to start to connect these dots uh, across the sector. And, and intentional or otherwise, that's a perfect segue into one of uh, your major, major recommendations, which is the creation of a nonprofit data hub for the region. So Liz, can you talk a little bit about what that is, what that means? Yeah, I want to say really quickly, um, there are examples of this across the country, primarily in university research settings. Um, so, you know, there, are, I want to say there's probably, to the best of my knowledge, around 10 to 15 of these um, research centers around the country. Um, and, you know, what we really, I think what we're interested in is being able to work with, um, in partnership with um, nonprofit stakeholders to be able to create a data infrastructure that allows us to um, be able to more effectively um, address limitations of public data that we currently have, um, 
be able to provide more timely data. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, what is the state of, you know, nonprofits in the region during COVID? To be honest, I don't have great data. Um, most of our data is between four to five years old. Um, uh, and the other thing too is, you know, again, kind of going back to the idea around um, local ownership. Um, and really what that means to me is, again, being able to identify what are the priorities, what are the questions that we have as a region, and how can we create data in, or how can we collect data and create data infrastructure that supports collecting data in a timely manner um, so we can have a good idea of um, what the landscape looks like in relation to those questions. Um, and I think the important part here too is that it's um, a system. It's not necessarily about creating a one-time report. It's about creating infrastructure that can continue to support strategic decision-making, continuing to provide insights into our landscape. Um, that really, is, it is an investment in infrastructure, but I think the returns can be enormous. You know, it's interesting. I, I was thinking back on the beginning of this discussion about, you know, the role of the national and regional groups and groups outside of St. Louis. And, you know, oftentimes those groups have access to a massive data set, you know, compared and contrasted with local. They don't know our region as well, but they sh they work in so many regions. And sometimes I feel like this this is totally qualitative, okay? But sometimes I feel like that allows regional or national groups to get in and do some of the work that could just as well be done by local or regional St. Louis groups, you know, uh, given the demographic and data tools, um, you know, to, to use the word compete in the nonprofit context, but but to compete. I mean, to, to actually, you know, because it's not that the people in our in our sector locally are any less talented, are any less experienced, or any less intelligent. So, in some ways, I feel like this may put some work that we've deferred or assumed that other groups might do. Maybe this gives us a little bit of a leg up we didn't have before. I don't know. That's conjecture. I don't know what you guys think. Look, a, a local environment, you know, especially when you're trying to think about. Um, issues across sectors or across disciplines or across organizations, it's really important to look at the local level um, because what we share in the St. Louis region is a common funding environment and a common history and a common regulatory, you know, sort of regime locally, statewide and nationally, that even if you look at our peer regions, I mean, even if you look at Kansas City and they share the same, you know, kind yeah. of state dynamics that we do, there's a very different history and there's a very different philanthropic landscape um, that absolutely matters in terms of um, how this work gets organized, let alone the most important thing, which is different communities with different community, you know, priorities and needs, uh, which need to be at the, at the front of the table. And so, you know, there is a sense that like the best way to do that in a meaningful and responsive way is locally. Um, I understand we've gotten a little bit of pushback on like, you know, why, why aren't these recommendations being made to the IRS or to the secretary of state <laughs> office? And look, I think there could be something cool that the federal government wanted to take a crack, even at like, just not the IRS collecting information, uh, around impact, but I don't think anybody is sort of like clamoring, you know, like really what we need is a, an add-on to the 990 with similar regulatory requirements right. uh, that ask questions we don't get to give impact uh, input on uh, about, you know, equity and impact in our sector. I think the process of constructing like meaningful measures in St. Louis on like, right. how would we know we are being responsive to community and, and making an impact you know, I, those seem to, the process of engaging in that is as powerful as the, the data that would be, you know, collected or shared at the end. Um, well, and, and, and really imagine, important. imagine yeah. if, if the IRS or some national group collected data about, um, you know, I'm making this up, effectiveness of large nonprofits versus small nonprofits. Just imagine what kind of bad kind of implications that would have for the nonprofit sector. You, you know, just made my palms sweaty talking about it, yeah. <laughs> I know, I mean, it would be misinterpreted, it would be misapplied, it would be a dis decision maker for who gets the money. I mean, it's, it, yeah. So you guys are citing all the reasons why 
there needs to be a very, very hefty local presence in this. And there are many other reasons. Let's well, and I think for, oh, go ahead. No, I was just also going to say um, one of the things we propose in, in the report in the recommendation to create a data hub and Liz mentioned other national models, many of which are great. Yeah, they're also maybe a little over reliant on surveys or sort of other tools that end up being like taxing for participants. So I think one of the things mm -hmm. is like, how do we make this as um, aligned to like information people already likely collect in some way, shape or form, uh, but are not sort of aggregated uh, together. And I think also like not avoiding, but just sort of saying like questions around outcome, right? Like, and like really where are we trying to move the needle? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be hard to make those things super yeah. uniform. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that, you know, when you talk about inputs and outputs, some people are like, well, that's not impact. And that is very true, but you do need a better assessment and connectivity around like inputs like funding as well as outputs, like who's on your board, What's your staff's demographic representation? What are the different locations of your nonprofit? And like, what populations are they trying to reach with your services? Like these questions are much, they're, they're not always easy to answer, but they're much simpler to answer in that there can be a common definition, like the things data is good for, a common definition, easy to measure, easy to align across organizations and political boundaries that will enable folks to really engage in the bigger questions of to what end together. Uh, and that's the work we should be focusing 100% of our time on, not sort of always like fumbling around in the dark to be like, well, how many early childhood centers even are there? Like that should be readily available. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And although I, I would say there's the human element, you know, there are board members who like to say, we served 2000 lunches last month. I mean, you know, there's, you're always going to have that. It's important. It is yeah. absolutely important. Yeah. Right. It doesn't answer the ultimate questions, of course. Okay. This is the Mythbuster time where you each get to say kind of either a Mythbuster or what surprised you the most in your findings. Liz, you want to start? Oof, this is hard. Um, I think Any, I already mentioned anyone. I already yeah. mentioned one about nonprofit pay. Um, did. I think the other thing that related to that I didn't know is that St. Louis City is in the top 30 um, metropolitan or sorry cities um, for nonprofit employment, um, which I did not know until this report. And to be honest, that is not my finding. That is something that I found somewhere else. <laughs> um, the other thing I will say really quickly is I I think I still have a lot of questions around contributed revenue um, in, in our region. Uh, we were able to do a little bit of research in that, but I think it raised more questions uh, for me than it provided answers. Um, and I, I am very curious about how things um, like uh, many corporations le leaving the region, about changes in nonprofit tax law and these other things, um, about how that's um, impacting contributed revenue in the region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good one. Paul, what about you? Sort of the, you know, there's conversation about town of like St. Louis is too many nonprofits. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be true. Right. Um, I think that my stance on it always is like, you got to actually push a little bit further and say, are there too many nonprofits trying to do the same thing for the same dollars? Right. Or are there like groups that are very um, representative of communities that they're that they're accountable to and trying to serve? And there just ends up being like a smaller nonprofit needed just to, to kind of meet that constituency. But one of the things I find is one, like, it, yeah, we may or may not have uh, too many nonprofits, but we are by no means the leader in terms of like how many uh, nonprofits are in, you know, a region in terms of the peer regions that we looked at. Uh, and in, in some ways we, we lag behind, especially in terms of new nonprofits created. Uh, and Liz, you can check me on the exact figures of this, you know, in the last five to 10 years. And so this narrative that we have too many nonprofits, either A, that's also very true in Baltimore, and there's something interesting that we can learn uh, about the sector as a whole and pushing on that question or B, the like too many nonprofit, you know, hand reining isn't really the right question to ask because it is something that exists in regions that are similar to St. Louis, but also exist in, in very different, um, you know, kind of states and um, uh, local environments. Yeah. And you touched on part of this before, but it's the... Um... You know, in your report, you talk about the concept that is research tested, 
about you know the more diffuse the service being provided is, typically the more contribution oriented the um, the the organization is. So if a merger occurs of a a bigger group with a smaller group, and the bigger group is more programmatic, and the smaller group is more you know diffuse in terms of the overall you know impact on the on the on the local region, you know a service that was needed and appreciated might give way just because of the dynamics of the organization. So, so way more important than how many. How many is good to know, um, but there are so many sub questions as to almost render it useless, yeah. Yeah, I think the question is not how many, but do we have the right supports? Do we have the services they need? Do we have the infrastructure, like, you know? Yeah, exactly right. Guys, I could ask 18,000 more questions and you'd be kind enough to answer them, but for our audience, I think 35 or 40 minutes is plenty. Um, you can read this report. Uh, we've sent it around. We will post it again. Um, Liz, I can't thank you enough for your authorship and for devoting your your research time abilities and experience to this. Paul, thank you for your work supporting Liz and for your work at the center. Uh, and thanks to everybody who uh, participated in this. And I wish you the best in moving forward on the next step, the next evolution of building data to support what we want, which is the best region we can possibly have, both from an equity perspective and otherwise. So thank you so much. Any last words from either of you? No, thank you for having us and uh, read the report or at least read the sort of like uh, summary sections. And there are some like nonprofit nerds out there that will love all of the, the graphs and context that, that Liz so dutifully put together. Yeah. And I think the questions you pose are really, really good. And, and I think those should spur um, more questions in people's minds that they should feel free to share with you as they, as they read it and go forward. Absolutely. Um, is, it, can you be, uh, is there contact information for both of you in the report or would you like to provide? Uh, I either believe so, or you know, folks can email um, me at least anytime, P at umzol.edu. Um, happy to answer questions and uh, dive into this. And yeah, just excited to see where the conversation takes us. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm very excited to see um, what conversation this does spark. Sorry, I have some very excited dogs. They agree. Um, well, you should. Yeah, but yeah, just excited for it to be published and excited to see what the response is. Thank you again thank for having you. us. No, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you next time at STL Nonprofit News. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.